All right, I want you to open your Bibles, please, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 22. Ezekiel, chapter 22. I'll give you a few moments to find that. Ezekiel 22. <coughs> And I'm going to begin reading down there at verse 23. Ezekiel 22, and I'm going to start at verse 23. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto her, Thou art the land that is not cleansed, nor reigned upon in the day of indignation. There is a conspiracy of her prophets in the midst thereof, like a roaring lion ravening the prey. They have devoured souls. They have taken the treasure and precious things. They have made her many widows in the midst thereof. Her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and profane. Neither have they showed difference between the unclean and the clean. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey to shed blood and to destroy souls, to get dishonest gain. And our prophets have daubed them with untempered mortar, seeing vanity and divining lies unto them, saying, Thus saith the Lord God, when the Lord hath not spoken. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy, yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge, and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. I'm going to stop right there. In this section, the Lord declares his complaints against the state of things in the city of Jerusalem and in the nation of Israel. Not only are the are they misled spiritually, but it has corrupted them morally and socially and politically. And the one always leads to the others. You want to see some of those worst uh, regimes in the world. Look at countries that kick God out with socialism, communism, like this country is attempting, attempting to do. We call this the great land of the free and God bless America, the land of religious liberty and freedom. You have to look far and wide to find that these days. This country is getting worse and worse all the time. You don't see it, you got to open your eyes. God describes the behavior of the priests and the prophets, and he says, quote, there is a conspiracy of her prophets, there, verse 25. Like a roaring lion ravening the prey, he says, they have taken the treasure and precious things, they have made her many widows in the midst thereof. You know, with a complete Bible in your hands, God doesn't have to send his future word by the mouth of human prophets any longer. And yet there are plenty of men in the world who think that he does. And they think that somehow God has raised them up as the prophet in question to tell you what to think, what to believe, what to do, what to do with your money, how to act, how to, how to conduct your affairs, uh, and every other decision in life. We call these people faith healers. Fake healers. The Benny Hens, The Kenneth Copelands. The Creflo Dollars. The send in your dollars. And all of that nonsense. These guys are nothing but two-bit charlatans. Yeah. Oral Roberts was a fake. Yeah. He was a fake every day of his public preaching life. And all of these guys learned their tricks from him. I tell you a personal story. I'm going to go ahead and tell it. Put it on the internet. It's public knowledge, so you don't need to conceal it. I used to work here in, in a funeral home here in Ontario. About 19... About 19 years ago, we had a funeral for a man who was bent forward with osteoporosis. His, cur the, his spine was curved so far forward, 
He was looking down at the ground, walking here in Ontario for 40 years. He was about my dad's age, and his son was about my age, and his body was so twisted. At the funeral home, we couldn't straighten him. That was something we, we can't do. He had the appearance of a man sitting up in bed. That's just how far forward his body was contorted. His son said, you know, I know it looks strange, Mike, but it's the only way I ever knew my dad. I said, you don't have to explain it to me. We see unusual things. It's just part of life. The very next day at the church, at the funeral, who should show up to the funeral but Oral Roberts and his wife, Evelyn? This man was Evelyn Roberts' younger brother. His brother-in-law, the great Oral Roberts, healing evangelist, claimed he had laid his hands on two and a half million people over his lifetime and got them well. Couldn't do a thing for his brother-in-law in 40 years. And Oral Roberts had just had eye surgery and they weren't sure if he would even make it to the funeral. The man hadn't even told his pastor that his brother-in-law was Oral Roberts. I wouldn't brag about it either. You know what that told me? That guy was a fake from the get-go. He's a phony, two-bit fraud, and uh, I don't mind repeating that story to everybody. All of these guys, Kenneth Copeland, the, the Kenneth Hagins, Crefto Dollars, and all of these guys on TBN, TV preachers, they all learned their tricks from him. They keep repeating the same nonsense that God's going to raise up Latter-day prophets and we're going to tell you what to do with your money and how to send it in. Send it in here and God will send you back a reward for a faithful giving to this ministry. How is it that God somehow the kingdom of God got tied to your ministry? How is it that it's all centered around you and your mailing address? These guys are phonies. They're two-bit fakes and don't ever believe them. Pity the person who would give money to them. God says, her priests have violated my law and have profaned mine holy things. Verse 26. Today's pastors who ought to be teaching the pure word of God, who claim that they believe in a pure word of God, do nothing of the kind. They're not Bible believers. They're Bible correctors. Verse 27 states, her princes in the midst thereof are like wolves ravening the prey. They're hunting down innocent blood. To shed blood and to destroy souls to get dishonest gain. Well, doesn't that describe politicians these days, the so-called public servants, your elected officials? Whether you're living in a monarchy, a parliamentary system, some communist or socialist regime, or some democratic republic that we used to live in here, um, once politicians get a taste of power, they don't want to get rid of it. They don't want to lose it. They want to keep it. And they're not always the brightest bunch in the, in the shed either. <laughs> they're not always the smartest people in the world. But they can be some of the most abusive, right. self-serving, self-aggrandizing uh, criminals uh, running loose. And yet they've got the power to decide your future, the future of your city, the future of your state, your county, and so forth. This results in the corruption of people. Notice verse 29 again. The people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy, yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. Is there anywhere that you can find decent, uh, honest men these days? Today's Father's Day, and that's why I'm on this subject today. God-fearing men in the world. Notice verse 30, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. The old slogan uh, for the U.S. Marine Corps was that the Marines were looking for a few good men. And so is God. So is God. So I call this sermon today a few good men. There are some qualifications to being a good father, being a man. 
taking responsibilities as a man, thinking like a man, trying to act like a man, being willing to work like a man. All of these are prerequisites to being a good father, to being a good father. You won't be a good father until you're a good man. You know, not too many uh, in our nation anymore. There are some, but God can always use more. He can always use more. Um, I'm uh, proud that my father is my father and that I'm his son. I hope I make him half as proud as he makes me. And there's nowhere you can go in Ontario where the um, reputation of Pastor Cash Shrive doesn't precede you. And it's a good reputation, too. My dad was an effective preacher. He's an effective soul winner. And he cares about the lost. I had a friend in high school, Robert Gindler, a year ahead of me in high school, but he used to come to the church here, got led to the Lord here. I think my dad led him to the Lord one Wednesday night. And I remember Bob telling me, you know something? I don't know anyone who's as evangelistic as Cass Shrive. I never heard anyone offer a compliment like that to my own father. When I thought about it, you know, you're right. When I was growing up, my dad would pick up hitchhikers in his pickup truck, lead them to the Lord before he dropped them off. Go to the hospital to visit somebody, pray with them in their bed, lead them to the Lord. The person's not in their bed, they, they're out at a doctor's appointment, talk to the next person in the next bed, lead them to the Lord. Witness to them on the doorstep, get the JWs and spin their heads around with a the scripture they don't know how to understand. It's always wonderful to watch. That's the way you want to do it, too. You want to, let me tell you something. When you talk to a cult member, first of all, you got to get your nose in your own Bible. And you dominate the conversation. You control it. You decide what they're going to answer, what they're not going to answer. You decide the question they're going to be asked. All they do is they go to their meetings. They have these little script meetings. They sit around comparing notes so everybody's on the same page. You know, well, next time, answer this question this way. Don't let them do that. You dominate it. You control it. You spin their heads around. That's the way to do it. I used to love watching my dad do it. And I'm starting to learn how to do it myself. And I hope, it, I hope that ability just gets stronger and stronger and more effective all the time. That's the way it should be. But uh, men don't always say what they mean. Ladies, let me help you out. Uh, young and old alike. Let me translate a few things that men really mean when they say something else. When a man says it would take too long for me to explain this to you, what he really means is, I have no idea how it works either. When a man says, honey, why don't you take a break? You're working too hard. What he really means is, I can't hear the TV over the vacuum. When a man says, that's very interesting, dear, what he really means is, why are you still talking? <laughs> you can stone me later, but just let me, bear with me. When a man asks, can I help with dinner? What he really means is, why isn't it ready yet? <laughs> when a man says, I heard you loud and clear, what he really means is, I have no idea what you just said. I'm faking it so you don't yell at me. When a man says, you look terrific, what he really means is, don't try on something else. We're late already and I'm getting hungry. When a man says, that's not what I meant, what he really means is, if it can be interpreted two ways, that one of those ways hurts your feelings, I meant the other way.
When a man asks, what color is this? It means he only recognizes four primary colors. <laughs> Men don't recognize uh, mauve and taupe and salmon and periwinkle. We don't, we don't recognize colors like that. When a man says, we're not lost, I know exactly where we are. <laughs> what he really means is no one's ever going to find us again. Now, on Mother's Day, we certainly give our attention and show our affection for our moms. Today, we should make a conscious effort to thank our dads as well. So I call the sermon, A Few Good Men. All right, if you want to take notes, good men are number one. Men who learn to lean on the Lord. Lean on the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. A man, a good man learns to lean on God for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Men are bad about wanting to control things, wanting to be in charge of things, wanting to say, I accomplished it. I did it on my own. You can't save yourself. You've got to trust God to save you. Amen. That's true if you're a man or a woman. But it's part of a woman's nature to put herself in the uh, hands of someone else she can trust. Men don't tend to want to do that. But the New Testament answers that problem. Matthew 18, verse 3, Christ said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Children have a way of trusting young uh, girls and young boys before they get too old. The boy becomes a teenager. First time he thinks he's ready to shave, you know. Of course, all he really needs is a piece of tape, you know, pull it off and then... <laughs> But he thinks he's big enough to make decisions, make grown-up decisions. He thinks he's big enough to, to rebel and say, no, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do that. A good man is a man who learns to lean on God for strength. Isaiah 40, verses 30 and 31. Even the youths shall faint and be weary and be young men, excuse me, and the young men shall utterly uh, fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall... Mount up with wings as eagles, they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Psalm 147, verse 10 says, He delighteth not in the strength of the horse, he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. A man gets proud because he's got big muscles, you know, or he thinks he has big muscles. When my dad was 66 years old, he was leg pressing 600 pounds at the YMCA every morning. My brother will attest, our dad's always been a strong man. And uh, how he did it, I have no idea. I get tired just watching it. <laughs> but, um, and yet that is not the measure of a man who's leaning on God, physical strength. And a man who's learned to lean on God is a man who learned to lean on God for his supply. Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Not all your greed, not just the things you want, but the things you need. All your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We all want to be the providers of our homes. We want to, we want to be the providers of our, uh, for our wives and our children. <clears throat> Women can get together and they talk about their um, experiences, their common stories, of raising children. When men get together, they want to compare, what do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? Their identity comes from, what they, from their career, 
from the job, they, the thing they have identified themselves as. I work here, I work there, this is what I do for a living. This is how they find their identity. Do you know something? Dr. Ruckman pointed something out years ago. I've never forgotten about it. Women and men, uh, have you ever noticed that men excel in just about every category? The greatest painters in the world, by and large, have been men. The greatest musicians in the world have been men. The greatest writers in the world have been men. The most famous producers of just about every other product and uh, item in the world has been a man. The greatest perfume designers are men. The greatest dress designers have been men. Things that we associate with uh, feminine qualities, the greatest chefs, the greatest cooks in the world have always been men. The greatest architects have been men. Not that women aren't capable, but statistically speaking, the greatest ones that dominate all of those fields have been men. And Dr. Ruckman's observation was this. Women are able to do something that men cannot do. Women generally are the bearers of life. They can bring new life into the world. Men are trying to create life. They're trying to create something that will bear their name, carry their identity into the future long after they're gone. So men find their identity in what they do, their career, their job, how they make their money, how they support their bills, or pay their bills, rather. That's very profound. I thought about that. You know, you could write a whole doctoral dissertation on that, probably. But a man is a, a, a real man, a good man is a man who's learned to lean on God for soundness. James 1 verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. You know, without Jesus Christ, a man has no good sense. He really doesn't. <laughs> See some of these dumb videos of guys doing stupid things so their buddies can record it, you know? Put it on the internet. Some of the stupidest people out there have a camcorder or they have a cell phone, they want to record themselves doing something stupid and they get a, a few laughs. How can I parlay this into a cheap income? All they end up doing is putting themselves in the hospital half the time. But a good man is also a man who has learned to lead. To lead is point number two. He's learned to lead his flesh. Galatians 5, verses 16 and 17. This I say, then walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. you got to lean, learn to lead, lead that flesh. Either uh, you lead the flesh, or the flesh will lead you. That's not how you want to live. That's not the kind of man you want to be. That's not the kind of good man God's looking for. You either lead your flesh, or it'll lead you. you no, know, among long-term inmates, 70%, I suppose that would be, let's say, 10 years or more in a, in a prison sentence. 70% grew up without fathers. 60% of rapists, 75% of adolescents who have been charged with murder grew up without fathers. Fatherless children, they say, are three times more likely to fail in school, to require psychiatric help, 
and attempt suicide as young men, teenagers, early 20s. That's from a book called The Father's Marriage and Welfare Reform by the Hudson Institute. Man has to lead his flesh, or the flesh will lead him. Man who learns to lead, learns to lead his family. Ephesians 5, verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. What kind of Christian man, I mean, what kind of saved, professing, born-again, um, uh, regenerated, saved Christian man doesn't want to take his children to church? Doesn't think his children need the Bible. He thinks, let the wife do that. That's her job. It's your job. It's the man's job. The Banuelos, I can't tell you how proud we are to have you here week after week. That's a man's job, a Christian man's job. God's going to hold you accountable for it, responsible for it. You better do it now. You want to stand before him um, caught off guard and having not done what you were expected to do. A man who is a good man has learned to uh, lead not only his flesh, but he leads, learns to lead his families to the Lord Jesus Christ. In God's wisdom, he's given every home one head. Anything with two heads is usually considered a monster. Now, I empathize with any lady who hasn't had the help of a husband or a good father of her children. That's a, that's a big chore to take on. God can give the grace to a, a Christian woman to do that, or to a woman who's even not a Christian. The strength to raise those children right and see they turn out with some sort of moral character. That's not the way God intended it. God intended it. That's not the way Christian wives want it. And if a real man is a real saved man, that's not the way he wants it to be either. If he's got any kind of um, uh, character about him at all, he wants to take his place as the man God intends him to be. Yes, he should. But a good man is one who's not only learned to lead his flesh, lead his family, but also learned to lead the fallen. Lead the fallen. What I mean by that is he's interested in other people getting saved. A good Christian man, a good Christian dad, a good Christian father, uh, is mindful of the lost around him. He's got to be concerned uh, the people around him. If you move into a neighborhood and you set no good example in your neighborhood next to your neighbors on either side around you, what kind of neighbors are they going to become? They see you they know the kind of person you are. They know the kind of uh, habits you exhibit. They know what they can expect. They know what time you leave, what time that you come home. They see, they see all these things. And uh, they have a certain expectation of you. And that's exactly as you want it. Romans 5, verse 12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Well, they're not going to be made alive if you don't win them to Christ. If you don't seek and make some effort to witness to somebody and tell them why uh, they need to be forgiven by God, only God can forgive a sinner. I was reading about a a Scottish preacher named Andrew Bonner back in the 1830s, 1840s. And he said, a lot of people want salvation, but very few people want the Savior. That's about the size of it these days. But a man uh, ought to be mindful of the lost people around him. You set an example to your children by showing an interest in lost people. Thirdly, let me say this, a good man today is a man who has learned to love, learns to love. First of all, he learns to love the Father, the Heavenly Father. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 to 3, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, 
I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity goes to the motive for why you're doing it. Charity is a much better word than love, as the modern translations like to use. Charity is love being put into action. It goes beyond that sort of uh, imprecise, indefinite word, love, and goes to the action. Men who have learned to love, they learn to love God, they've learned to love their families. Ephesians 5, 25, God admonishes every husband to love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Some will say, well, if I didn't love her, I wouldn't have married her in the first place, would I? Would I? Yeah, but love goes beyond simply having an, an emotional feeling and attraction on the day of your wedding. It's wanting the best and the welfare of that other person uh, more than you want the welfare and the benefit and the, and the goodness for anybody else in life. The admonition goes far beyond just telling the husband to love his wife as long as she's beautiful. And if she's not beautiful, she won't, he won't love her any longer. There's a joke about the, the uh, man who was upset by something his wife had done. And he said, how can you be so beautiful and so stupid at the same time? And she had a great response. She said, well, God made me beautiful so you would love me. He made me stupid so I would love you. But a good man also learns to love the fellowship. What I mean by that is the church, the body of believers. He's concerned about his fellow Christians. He's concerned about his Christian friends. The Bible says in Galatians 6, verse 2, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. If a man doesn't know how to do that, his children won't learn how to do it. His wife won't see it by example. His Christian friends won't learn about his character, his uh, Christian uh, personality by example. He didn't exhibit anything worth them watching or behaving or imitating. These are all things that are necessary for a good man. Um, God's looking for a few good men. And it, we, we, it's funny how often we use things like the military, the camaraderie, the esprit de corps, the Marine Corps, uh, to, to show the kind of tight, close-knit fellowship that can come between people who are sharing the same goal, the same objective, the same burden, and they're working towards the same uh, pursuit. I'll tell you what, I've never, I don't know that I've ever done this. I'm going to recommend one video on YouTube. I think you'll actually like it. It's a, I don't remember the title, but you can find it. It's the, like the Expedition, uh, USMC Expedition uh, um, Drumline, Drumline Band. They're having a sort of a freestyle um, band competition against the uh, Marine Corps of South Korea. Two groups together, I think they're over in Seoul. And so the, the South Korean band, they, they do their their bit, and they're pretty good. Then the U.S. Marine Corps, they do their bit, and they're all marching towards each other and playing in each other's faces. But I love that kind of um, drum line, and they're having a great time. They have great um, camaraderie between them. And, uh, and the one uh, sergeant asking for a show of hands, who played best, who played best? And he finally said, that's a draw. It was a lot of fun watching it. You can find it. But uh, God's looking for a few good men. And on Father's Day, what better opportunity to remind ourselves that I want to be the kind of man God wants. I want to be the kind of man God needs. I don't want to be a man who's wasting his time, wasting God's time with my life. I don't want to be the kind of man who's an embarrassment 
to the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think you want to be either men, whatever position God's put you in. You know, there are a number of men in my life who I can say are my heroes, a number of ways. Pastor Kim is one of my heroes. Brother Lee's dad is one of my heroes. Dr. Ruckman is one of my heroes. My father is one of my heroes. A lot of men I've known, men I've worked with, I couldn't say they're my heroes, they're bums. But the ones God's put in my path and I've had the privilege of knowing and listening to and sitting and whose preaching and teaching I've been able to sit under and learn from, those men are heroes of mine because they, they do what they ought to do day in and day out. They try to manage everything as to the best of their ability with God's help, their families, their church, their Bible reading, their Bible study, their growth, their work, their job, their school. These are the kind of men God wants. These are the kind of men God needs.